हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते नमस्ते गौरव नमस्ते गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग वी वर टुगेदर लाइक टू मिनट्स अगो बट वी शुड से गुड इवनिंग टू ईच अदर अगेन सो वेलकम डिंगली वेलकम केबी सर वेलकम गौरव एंड वेलकम ऑल द अटेंडीज हियर Uh, today we've got uh, uh, many people uh, registered for this webinar and slowly steadily they all coming in uh, welcome rohit sir zareen puneet silu santel gitanjali oh uh, good to see you gitanjali lesley um many other friends sudeep ji is also here welcome welcome friends so this is um uh one of the webinars of let's go birding series uh, let's go birding series uh, was started by kv sir and asian adventures together of indian birds the idea was to bring more opportunities for the members of indian birds uh, the community on facebook to to listen to stalwarts in conservation like uh, dr yong dingley who's been an old friend from, from singapore and um, i'll quickly introduce him to you and then you know he'll get started with his um webinar in the meantime let me quickly send you the link for indian birds those who do not know about indian birds are not on part of uh, part of the group you can click this group and become a member um or a participant here so um uh, let me start with introducing kb sir kb and i have been friends for a long long time and with some past karmic karma also you never know you know so um <laughs> but you know let me tell you friends this man single handedly created this group called indian birds which is the largest birding community group on the planet on facebook and it has been instrumental in doing fantastic work in terms of conservation in terms of um, uh, you know locating habitats new species exchange of information but, and helping photographers to take great photos so there's a lot of exchange that happens which is meaningful if you're on the group you would know this if you're not then please go right there and um, um, Uh, KB and I have been discussing various other things that we want to do in the birding world to make it more meaningful for climate change and for other things that we will unfold once it gets a little more mature. And Gaurav, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Mud. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Gaurav Nalkur. Uh, I'm a passionate wildlifer and avid bird watcher, and uh, I'm also a big believer. in the fact that wildlife tourism and ecotourism uh, can be great tools for raising awareness about <laughs> conservation uh, and can we help to showcase and preserve local wildlife and culture and uh, professionally i'm training to be an ecotourism specialist uh, educationally i've completed my masters in biodiversity and i'm qualified as a wildlife researcher and uh, you know i've been lucky for the last few years to be working with mohit and asian adventures and uh, you know both mohit and nation adventures as a uh, company both share this dream of mine of using uh, wildlife tourism as a great conservation tool fantastic so uh, <clears throat> you know uh, let me tell you uh, one or two things about webinar in case if there's a internet glitch don't go away i will i have this thing here called panic button which i will press and then this will reboot and then we'll all come back to the webinar just in case of the internet glitch mm-hmm. second thing is that keep typing your questions in the chat at the end of it kv sir and um, dr yong ngi will jointly take up these questions and will will talk about uh, questions and other things that they want to uh, so here is a bit about uh, dr yong ngi is a conservation biologist working on the conservation of wetlands and migratory species at birdlife international he works closely with teams in several asian countries to develop projects to protect threatened migratory species such as the spoonbill sandpiper and nordman's green shank 
Dingley has written widely, widely on the region and most recently launched two new field guides on Malaysia and Singapore respectively, as well as the popular best 125 bird watching sites in Southeast Asia. Oh, I saw it all over the place in Sabah and I was so pleased. Uh, Dingley regularly visits India for bird watching and most recently accidentally discovered the country's first acceptable record of pale-legged leaf warbler in the Andamans. So over to you, um, Dingli, and I will start your presentation. Um, there you go. And okay. uh, so uh, I will. What I suggest uh, in between uh, Dingli, if it is comfortable, so that it doesn't become like a long monologue. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, take a pause, you know, every 10, 15 minutes or so, uh, so that, you know, we just pick up a few questions or any ideas and thoughts that we may have and try and address them, you know, and it also breaks the monotony of a, you know, of a, of a, mon of a monologue, you know, from your side. So I think uh, let's do that. So whenever we feel like take a pause and we will, you know, just have a couple of minutes question answers. And then, of course, you can resume a presentation again. Uh, your sound is, I think, switched off. Can you just switch on again? Could you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, Super. Of course can. Yeah. Thanks very much. Well, thank you for having me here. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here um, in this uh, webinar uh, to tell you my life story, my long and convoluted life story. Uh, but of course, with a particular focus on birds, uh, I'm very grateful to Gaurav, uh, Gaurav uh, Mohit and uh, KB for inviting me uh, to be part of this web uh, webinar. Um, and also for introducing me, um, as uh, Mohit has mentioned, um, I've known Mohit actually for uh, quite a while, maybe 20 years at the very least, uh, from the first time we went birding together in Delhi in 2003, if I recall correctly. And uh, we've been in touch for uh, quite a while since then. So um, thanks for having me back here. Uh, the title of my presentation is called Conservating Migratory Waterbirds in Southeast Asia. Where are we now and what's next? So the, basically today's presentation, what I will try to do is to persuade you why migratory birds matter and how can we best protect them. Uh, I will also share a little bit about my personal journey. Uh, how did I come to become a bird watcher? Uh, how did I meet people and learn along the way? Make some mistakes here and there, but learn more different things along the way and also other interests that are kind of peripheral to birding. Yeah. So um, uh, KB, I think I need to hit the, the orange next button, right? Ah, okay, brilliant. Ken, thanks. Okay. It's been a while since I used this platform, so I just want to refresh my memory how, how to go about this here. So, um, unfortunately, bird watching was a is an is an hobby that has that has consumed me for a large part of my life. It came through an accident back in the nineties, when I was in uh, elementary school or primary school, as we call it here in uh, in Singapore. And uh, I remember vaguely that uh, it was all because of a bird that, uh, and often it starts for a lot of us from a bird that we we observe but we don't know and we went to find out more about it and end up becoming quite interested in birds, realizing that there are more than just one or two dull species of birds around. So the bird that sparked me uh, is actually a bird that you probably, many of you probably have seen in different parts of India, uh, the black naped oriole. Uh, the black naped oriole is a common bird in uh, the Malay Peninsula, which I live in, and uh, I remember seeing one when I was in primary school during music class, uh, and I had no idea what it was. So I think that whole experience of realizing that, oh, the birds in Singapore are not just crows and miners. I think for most of the ordinary folks here, they assume that all the birds are just crows, miners, and sparrows. So that black Nap oriole was my bright spark. I think uh, for Salim Ali, it was a yellow-throated sparrow. I think each of us have our special bird, the bird that triggered it all. So for me, it was just uh, a black nap Oreo. Um, but of course, before I got into birds, I was already into art. Uh, I've been drawing a lot since I was even in, uh, you know, before even I went into primary school. And I think uh, having an interest in art and having an interest in wildlife and birds is actually a good combination because you can always put them together and you uh, end up get, keep keeping yourself very busy with lots of things during the free time that you have during your childhood. So I'm one of those people who uh, love birds, love drawing, love painting, and I put them together. And I can, I can say that this has consumed uh, a large part of my life. 
uh, even until today, uh, birds are still a part and parcel of my daily life. When I went to university, I went to study ecology. Of course, by the time I went to university, I was already a pretty hardcore birder. Before I went to university, I've already uh, visited the Indian Himalayas for birding uh, with Mohit and other birders in uh, Delhi. And um, I decided, to, uh, well, the, the tough thing to do was to study ecology and biodiversity. It's not the best uh, thing to study at university, as many of us know, because um, as someone in your early 20s, um, there aren't that many job options for a person studying biology and ecology. It is nice to go out there to look at forests and animals and plants. But when people ask, so what are you going to do after you finish your degree? Um, at that time, I was kind of like, I have no immediate ideas. I'm not sure what. I will see how it goes and uh, take the next step. Um, eventually, I, I became a high school teacher. I spent uh, the first bits of my career teaching, uh, ironically, biology and philosophy in high school for a few years. But I think being in high school was also quite good for uh, my bird watching hobby because uh, I, I think those of you who are teachers, you know that you have school holidays and these are time that you can take long periods out in the field looking at birds and wildlife. So my first career started um, in teaching. Uh, interestingly, um, I didn't stay that long in teaching and at some point I felt that the calling had come that I should uh, do something to protect biodiversity. So it was good for me to be in high school telling my students about how great birds were and uh, how beautiful rainforests are. But I thought that I should do also a little bit more uh, to help to conserve biodiversity. And that's when I made a really difficult decision called to quit from teaching a stable job in the civil service, but to go into some uh, probably uh, you could say the path, the, path, the path less trodden. I went into studies again. Uh, I went to do a, a PhD on ecology. Um, and that's where I spent another four years thinking a little bit about uh, nature and how to protect uh, nature. Well, alongside all that academic interest and interest in birds and documenting birds and uh, observing them, I also always had that interest in art. So I pursued my own independent interest in art. I'm never form I was never formally trained in art, but I thought it was, uh, is a, it was a good set of skill sets to, you know, to have because you could document the birds. If you see a rare bird, you can at least draw it. If you don't have a camera, back in the days, it was not so common for us to have cameras. At least you can sketch those birds and provide evidence that, oh, I've seen this wobbler or I've seen that bird, which is really rare. And uh, this is the evidence for that. So um, I, I, I became a... <laughs> Uh, hobbyist, you could so say a hobbyist artist. Sometimes I engage in really um, uh, uh, complex personal projects. And one of the projects I feel really proud of is this illustration I created uh, of the birds of the montane forest of uh, Malaysia. Uh, for those of you who have been to Malaysia, I think one of the most famous bird watching places in Malaysia is this uh, hill station. Uh, it's a little, a little bit like Nainital. This hill station is called Fraser Hill. And for those of you who've ever got to Fraser's Hill, you can see many of these Himalayan bird species. They are right here at the southern extension of their distribution. So some of these species like uh, silver eared uh, Mesia, snowy brow flycatcher, red-headed Krogon, you can find them here in Fraser Hill in Malaysia. Um, so uh, this is one of my prouder pieces of work. Other pieces of work that I, I, I did spend a lot of time thinking about was uh, a project that I did on the birds of Singapore when I was uh, in senior high school. So I got brought in to illustrate a book, um, which took a lot of my time. But of course, uh, every struggle comes with lessons that you've learned. So um, yeah, that's where I say that's where art and ecology converges. Um, Going a little bit further and into my professional interests, um, of course, um, I think as Mohit has introduced, I am I work at an NGO uh, called BirdLife International. Um, BirdLife International tries to do a lot of different work on bird conservation all around the world. We have different teams, different departments. Where I am working on, I am in the what I call the migratory bird department. So I work closely with people uh, to protect migratory birds and I've been on this piece of work actually for more than seven years, seven years working on migratory birds. It's a, it's, it's a piece of work that is really fulfilling because you see that you can actually contribute to direct uh, 
protection of species and wetlands on the ground. But at the same time, there are also huge challenges uh, that we always struggle to, 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 to fight off, like getting governments to agree with us on what is important to protect and what is not important to protect. Uh, lots of uh, different challenges. And yeah, just a, a quick little bit of showcase of some of the book projects that I've been involved with over the last 10 years. Um, I, I think the, the the one big project that has taken up a lot of my time, in fact, still taking up my time right now, is the book on the left-hand side. Some of you may have seen it before on the online bookstore. This is the birds of Malaysia and Singapore. I've lived in much of my life in Malaysia and Singapore. So um, this is a book that I feel very strongly about writing. Um, for those of you who plan to come to this part of the world, I think this is probably a useful book for you. It introduces not just uh, the birds and how to identify them. Uh, many of you will find that are shared with India, but you will also find that there's a lot of useful information on where are the best forests, where are the best wetlands to, to go birding. Uh, and then, of course, Mohit mentioned the best 125 birding sites in Singapore. This is a long project. I think it's taken me two, three years. At some point in my career, I lived in Australia. And this was one of the big projects I did when I was living abroad uh, to put together a piece of work. I think somebody told me back in the 2010s that there's never no, there's no such piece of work that documents all the wonderful birding areas in Southeast Asia. Um, in one single volume. You, you've got all these books on specific countries like Philippines and Indonesia and Vietnam, but there just simply wasn't one document, one book that brought everything together. So this is uh, that project that took up a lot of my time in university. I spent a lot of my uh, late nights working on the entries for this book and calling up people from all over Southeast Asia, persuading them to contribute to the book, uh, contributing photographs, entries. And yeah, I think it's one of my proudest projects. Um, it's, it's definitely not... Uh, not uh, out of print yet. I think it can still be found in many bookstores and library. And I, su I suspect that this will be a useful book for some of you birders coming to Southeast Asia. You could use this book to get details from anywhere from Burma to Vietnam to Indonesia. Which all countries are covered in this, uh, Degli, in the Southeast yeah. Asia? Um, every country, all 11 countries. Well, Timor-Leste is typically not counted in many books, but we we fought hard for Timor-Leste to be included because it's a country that uh, has a lot of special birds, but people just don't go there. But if we can get more people to go there, they might find more interesting species in Timor-Leste. Yeah. So all the other mainland countries are covered. Burma, Vietnam, um, Malaysia, of course, Singapore, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Okay. Yeah. And then... Um, an older piece of work, one of my earliest books was a book on the birds of Southeast China. Um, this is a project that started from a conversation that I had with one of my friends in Hong Kong. Uh, while we were having tea in a cafe in Hong Kong, we came out with this book on the birds of uh, Southern China, of which Hong Kong is a part of. So um, I think we learned a lot with that book uh, because it was the first time, one of the first few books I ever write, we struggled. I didn't realize it was so difficult to put a book together because you needed to make sure that all three of us in three different parts of the world are in tune with each other and write things in a consistent way because you don't want a bird book whereby page 5 to 20 looks like Liu Yang's writing. Page 30 to 50 sounds like Yu Yatung's writing and the rest looks like my writing. So that was a good training for me. Um, and I think it built the foundation, paved the way for the other books that came down the road. We at least had a clearer idea of how to put these book projects together. So um, I, I think enough of myself. I think uh, I've talked quite a bit on these things. Um, and now going more into conservation, uh, my next few slides will take... Uh, people in the floor into the East Asian Australasian flyway from the Southeast Asia perspective. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the East Asian Australasian flyway. It's part and parcel of my life. Every hour of my life, I see these will appear in my email, in the reports. I've reached a stage whereby I can pronounce it without stammering East Asia Australasia flyway. It's uh -huh. quite remarkable. <laughs> uh, but it's a region of the world that I'm I'm stuck in, that I'm based in. Um, but of course, there's lots of spectacular migratory species um, in uh, this flyway. And um, even though if you look at many documents, India is not explicitly included in this flyway. If you look at it from a biological point of view, the eastern uh, states of India technically is part of the East Asian Australasian flyway together with Bangladesh. 
And that's where you have many, many of these warblers that you can see in the far eastern part of the country. Many of the warblers that you get anywhere from Manipur to Nagaland to Andamans and Nicobars, these are bird species on the East Asian Australasian Flyway. So in the next 20 minutes, I will present a case of what's so great about this flyway. What are the special birds here? Um, why must it be protected? What are the dangers that birds are facing this flyway? And some of the, the success stories to hopefully give you and give me and everyone else a little bit of hope that even though there's a lot of doom and gloom in how we protect migratory birds, there are actually successes happening. They are not that famous, but they are happening in different countries of uh, our corner of Asia. So first of all, um, just a quick little bit of introduction to the East Asian Australian Flyway. I want to bring you into Southeast Asia. Now, I'm, I'm obsessed with Southeast Asia, partly because I spend most of my life here. But just to remind uh, everyone how important Southeast Asia is for biodiversity at the global scale. I think many of you may have heard about this concept of prioritizing hotspots. Uh, and many parts of the world are considered as biodiversity hotspots. Hotspots are areas that are recognized because they have so many species of trees and plants, so many species of birds, so many species of mammals, reptiles. They become biodiversity hotspots using some sort of criteria that NGOs around the world have developed. So in India, there are many hotspots. You've got the Western Ghats, you've got the Himalayas, you've got the Eastern Himalayas, and part of the far eastern bits of India is also in the Indu Burma hotspot, which is quite similar to where we are here in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is a very special place for biodiversity globally because it is the ultimate mother of hotspots for biodiversity in the continent. You'll see that uh, the countries right to the east of India, Burma to Vietnam, this is one hotspot on its own, one big hotspot close to a million kilometers in land area. So from Myanmar, including the Andamans and Nicobars, together with Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, this is one hotspot we call Indu Burma, uh, where you've got all these familiar species, um, lots of barbets, lots of babblers, too many babblers, and also some of the most mysterious species that we have here in Southeast Asia. For those of you who keep an eye on the rarest birds, this is also the hotspot that shares the pink-headed duck with India. So the pink-headed duck belongs to the Indo-Burma hotspot together with the Eastern Himalayan um, uh, Eastern Himalayas hotspot. Then of course further south of Indo-Burma, the four or five countries of Indo-Burma is where I am here in Southeast Asia. This is the hotspot we call Sundaland. Sundaland is made up of four countries. Malaysia, many of you may have gone birding in Malaysia. Singapore, which historically was united with Malaysia in the one country. Indonesia, the biggest country in Sundaland. And of course, uh, the, the Sultanate of Brunei Darussalam. This is a very rich hotspot. It is not as rich as Indu Burma in terms of bird species, but it is very rich in terms of plants. The whole place is dripping with plants. I think uh, for Malaysia alone, 15,000 species of higher plants. So incredible hotspot that you will have seen if you visited parks like Taman Negara in Malaysia or the Kerinci Sablat National Park in Sumatra. And then further to the east of Sundaland, we've got the Philippines. The, the whole country of Philippines is one hotspot. It's a very interesting hotspot. It's not as rich in terms of species as Sundaland, but it is very, very unique because so many species are endemic to the Philippines. Pretty much half of the resident birds in the Philippines are endemic to the country and then right to the south of the philippines you have sulawesi you have this whole cluster of islands of indonesia we call wallacea uh, which is uh, a, a hot spot made up of well, seven thousand islands and these islands are again they're not as rich in terms of species if you look at the number of species of sulawesi not as many as borneo sulawesi has less than 300 resident species borneo has close to 500 even more but Sulawesi has a very, a very endemic for, uh, bird fauna. So uh, approximately slightly less than half of Sulawesi's bird species are endemic to Sulawesi or its su surrounding islands. So it's a very unique island full of endemics. It's almost on the same level as Madagascar, half the globe away. So putting Southeast Asia into context, Southeast Asia, which sits within the East Asia Australasia flyway, it's a super important area for biodiversity. A lot of us, we know a lot about the unique birds, the unique resident birds of Southeast Asia. Of course, we know about the hornbills. They are not the migratory birds. We know about the pitas, the babblers, 
Um, but then I also wanted to remind everybody here that Southeast Asia is also part of the East Asian Australasian Flyway. Let's call it the EAAF in short. And uh, this is one of three big uh, migratory flyways around the world. As you know, migratory birds are migratory grouped birds by flyways, are by flyways. Right? Migratory birds are grouped by flyways, um, which are geographically shared area where they migrate along. So around three flyways have been identified for Asia. Uh, India is part of what we call the Central Asian Flyway. So all these birds that breed in the center part of Russia, Central Asia, Nepal, Bhutan, they migrate through. And many of these species, they winter in peninsula India and in Sri Lanka. But if you go further east on the globe, if you spin the earth further east, you come to what we call the East Asia Australasia Flyway. The name is self-explanatory. It combines East Asia and then, of course, Australia, which we define broadly as Australasia, together with uh, Southeast Asia sandwiched in the middle. The East Asia Australasia Flyway is one of the world's largest flyways. I, I, I think it's probably the world's largest flyway in terms of land area because it includes a huge chunk of Russia, it includes a huge chunk of China, and a huge chunk of Australia. And uh, this is also amongst the most uh, crowded of the world's flyways. There's a large chunk of the human population living here. Actually, all the Asian flyways are very crowded because Central Asian flyway, there's a lot of people living in India and other surrounding countries. In the East Asian Australian flyway, you've got huge populations in China, in Korea, in Japan. So this is a big flyway, but it's also a very crowded flyway. And according to the books, this flyway is used by more than 50 million migratory water birds. Actually, I'm not sure if this number is 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 precise or not precise. It could be we could be way off because we don't always manage to count every single water bird in the flyway. But according to uh, the biologists, there are about 50 million water birds using this flyway on their migrations. How many species are in the East Asian Australasian flyway? Uh, there are about 500 over species. Um, we often think about the water birds, but we also cannot forget that this flyway is used by many species of land birds. So we think about the pelicans, the sandpipers, the plovers, um, storks, and cranes, uh, all these familiar groups that we have in India. But there are also a lot of small birds that migrate in this flyway. We cannot forget that there are also more than 60 species of warblers, 20 kinds of robins, robins, warblers, cuckoos. Um, we also have the Amur falcon, the Amur falcon, which was made famous recently uh, by the work that's been done by many conservationists in uh, Northeast India, in Nagaland and uh, many other species that many of you here are familiar with, including at least two or three species of pitas. Uh, we have got the fairy pita, the blue wing pita, and the hooded pita. So this is a very impressive flyway in terms of land area and also in terms of bird diversity. It's also diverse in terms of ecosystem. I have this map that I created together with some of my colleagues for a, for a study that we did a few years ago. We wanted to show the different kinds of um, ecosystems in the East Asian Australasian flyway. So you look at the different colors on the map. This flyway is very rich in uh, ecosystems. Right at the north, you have got the blue color, which represents the tundra. Many kinds of uh, shorebirds and plovers, they breed in the tundra. But as you go further south, you have forests, you have the coniferous forests, you have some huge areas of deserts like the Gobi Desert, for example. And then you go up to the, the barren arid Tibetan plateau that spans many countries, China, Bhutan, Nepal, India, in Ladakh. Um, fantastic arid landscape. Not that many species, but many of the most impressive migrants uh, that we can see here in Southeast Asia and in India, they breed in the Tibetan plateau, the most famous one being the Bahidat goose and the Radishil duck. So um, very diverse flyway with lots of different habitats. And then of course, as you, as you go further south in this flyway, towards Southeast Asia, you see all the green color, the, the, the mid green color, that is all tropical rainforest. Tropical rainforests are a kind of environment that is very rich in species, um, but it is also a very important wintering habitat for many kinds of migratory birds. We don't tend to associate migratory birds with tropical rainforests, but if you come to Malaysia or Sumatra and look at the tropical rainforest in the middle of winter, maybe not a good idea because that is the time of our monsoon, you can find all these warblers, all these flycatchers and robins from Russia, from China, all coming here in the middle of winter. So incredibly diverse flyway. 
incredibly rich in species, but at the same time, incredibly threatened flyway. This is the flyway that has the most number of threatened species amongst all flyways. So if I compare this flyway with the uh, European African flyway or the American flyways, this flyway wins hands down in terms of species that are endangered, critically endangered um, and vulnerable. Um, this is nothing to be proud of. It means that we have a lot of conservation problems in the flyway. Um, that we need to address, and this is what I will be talking about in the in the next few slides. Yeah, coming to Southeast Asia, of course, as you can see from the map, Southeast Asia sits right in the middle of the flyway. Um, and being at the middle of the flyway, if if you look at the flyway from the point of view of an hourglass, Southeast Asia is like the the middle point, the constriction in the hourglass, which is to say that most of the birds that are migrating from north to south and south to north, they have to pass through Southeast Asia. So if you come to Southeast Asia in winter, um, besides those birds that are hiding in the jungle, all these warblers and flycatchers, you can also see huge congregations of migratory shorebirds. For example, in the coast of Thailand, in the coast of Malaysia, and different parts of Indonesia, you can see huge flocks of shorebirds, like uh, the very rare and unique uh, Northman's green shank. Sometimes we call it the spotted green shank. And a few species that are quite rare in India, species like the Chinese egret, uh, amongst others. All right. So South Southeast Asia, by virtue of its geography, it sits right in the middle of the of the flyway. Now, um, coming back to a bit of biology, uh, just to get people's head on the on the on the right platform. Yeah, to think about migratory birds, uh, and also looking at all the different bird books that we've been looking at, we typically think about the migratory bird's life cycle. Or its travel, its 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 uh its its um its uh life history, from three different components, right? When we think about migratory birds, we often think about where they breed. So things like the northern forests, like boreal forests, tundra. These are the habitats that the migratory birds. Many kinds of migratory birds breed in. Um, migratory birds, <coughs> of course, during the winter they go to these places. We we call we. We call them the wintering grounds, right? All the places that we have in Southeast Asia and in India. But of course, in between the breeding grounds and the wintering grounds, many migratory birds, they have to find places to refuel on their migration. So they have to stop somewhere, a few days, eat as much as they can, get the energy back and keep flying again. So these are what we call the, uh, the uh, stopover or the refueling sites. And refueling sites are just as important for migratory birds um, as it is for compared to the breeding sites and the wintering sites. And the reason why I want to bring this back to your, your minds is because um, a lot of us, we tend to think a lot about the breeding grounds and the wintering grounds, but we forget that the migratory birds, for them to have successful migrations, they must be able to rest and refuel successfully without being killed, without dying from hunger at these so-called stopover or refueling sites, which could be wetlands or forests across the region. So Southeast Asia provides a lot of migratory birds with stopover or refueling sites. At the same time, it is also um, what you can consider the end point of migration for many species, the wintering ground, so to speak. And this is something that we know more and more in the last few years because scientists have been studying this more and more carefully. Um, for more than 100 years, people have been looking at migratory birds. We started ringing these migratory birds to figure out where they are coming from but in the last few years people have been you know making use of the latest technology to track the migration of many of these birds so we now have more than ever before all sorts of uh, transmitters tags that we can put on the bodies of migratory birds that allow us to pinpoint exactly how and where and when they are migrating uh, with this we can actually plot out the exact migratory routes for many species to a very high level of accuracy and precision. And uh, uh, there's a study that I did recently whereby we looked at some of the studies for different species, uh, just to get a sense of how these birds were moving across the Asian continent on their migrations. A lot of these lines, these colorful lines that you can see on my slide here, these lines are the exact migratory routes that the birds took. And these lines couldn't have been possible 50, 60 years ago, we didn't have the technology to look at migration to such a level of detail. So technology is changing things fast for us as conservationists and as biologists. And you can see that uh, raptors, many species of raptors have now been successfully tracked with transmitting devices. 
going forward now and into the future, these devices will become smaller and smaller. And the smaller they become, that means that we can also put those devices on the very small Lamberts, like the small warblers and robins. And of course, there are quite a few of such studies that were done in the last 10 years by some of my colleagues and even perhaps your colleagues to look at the migration of these very small landbirds. And you can see for yourself that we now have a better and clearer understanding of how these migratory landbirds, the small body ones, are migrating across the um, East Asian Australasian uh, flyway. So my point here is very simple. Science is changing how we uh, help birds. Science is changing how we conserve these migratory birds because it is now allowing us to pinpoint exactly where the birds are using. If we know where the birds are using, then we will know where are these important places that we must protect, getting the sense of where and when the birds are there. If we know when the birds are there, then we will try to our best to work with the local people to make sure that the threats are controlled when the birds are at those sites. So science is changing the way we we know about migratory birds and how we study migratory birds. And obviously a lot of research have been published uh, uh, in the last 20, 30 years, some of which are done by the colleagues that I work with very closely. Um, in bird life, I work with several teams of colleagues in many different Asian countries. I work with a team in Malaysia. I work with teams in Vietnam, Cambodia, in uh, even in Myanmar and beyond uh, to, to not just do bird counts, but also the work with professional researchers to track migratory birds and their movements. And this is hopefully going to help us to figure out where the most important places to protect are. So science is a big part of conservation. We can't do it without the science. We need to continue to spend money to do bird surveys. Uh, bird watchers like you and I, we also contribute to science. We are part of citizen science. We collect data that platforms like eBird India and other eBird uh, frameworks pull together. And this data, again, is very helpful for conservation. Uh, some of you may see that recently the state of India's birds was published. And this piece of work, again, represents the, you know, the combined efforts of all the, uh, the bird watchers across the country contributing their own little uh, observations from their, their favorite patches of birding spots and all that. So everybody has a part to play in, in, uh, in conserving uh, birds through science and through direct action. And the next thing I wanted to talk about in my presentation is to bring you all uh, to a part of the flyway that we don't often think about, but it's an equally important part of the East Asian flyway. So I know my presentation, I've talked a lot about Southeast Asia, but I'm going to bring uh, everyone further north to an area that we are not familiar with called the Yellow Sea. The Yellow Sea is um, an area that is sandwiched between China, North Korea, and South Korea. And every conversation about the East Asian Australasian flyway cannot be done without talking about the Yellow Sea, simply because the Yellow Sea is the most important stopover area in this flyway which is to say that almost every migratory shorebird that I see anywhere from Malaysia to Vietnam to South China to Australia, on their way here, they would have passed by and spent several days in the Yellow Sea to eat as much as they can. Um, the Yellow Sea has some of the biggest mud flats in Asia. For those of you who have the chance to visit places like Shanghai in China or Seoul in South Korea, go to the coast and you'll see these mud flats. They, they stretch for miles into the, into, the, into the coast when the tide drops. So these mud flats are massive. They are full of worms and clams and other invertebrates. And this is what makes them so important for migratory species as a place to stop over and feed as much as they can before they keep flying. So the Yellow Sea is truly important. And again, it is a big part of the conservation efforts that we are doing in this flyway for many kinds of migratory water birds. The most famous of them all is the one that you can see on my slide. On the left hand on my slide is the species called the Spoonbilt Sandpiper. Just let me throw a question to the floor. Has there, has there been any spoon sand sandpiper records in India so far? Has there been any recent records? This is something I'm very curious about. Yeah. Yeah. So what I can recall is that not recently, but historically there are a couple of records uh, from Chilka Lake, even from Point Calamir. Chil Chilka Lake. Uh. And also in po at Point Calamir, which is, uh, you know, deep down south, close to Sri Lanka. Mm. So, but uh, I can't recall any any mm. recent uh, records unless anybody in the audience has any clue. Of course, there are mm. uh, there are uh, there are regular sightings and reports from Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. not from India at the moment. 
Ah, uh, okay. So a quick shout out to uh, friends, birders out there. If you go to uh, West Bengal or the coast between West Bengal to uh, Tamil Nadu and looking at shorebirds, this is where you must give an eye for these uh, spoon sandpipers. sand pipers. They are not easy to spot because they are so tiny. They look like uh, they look like um, rufous neck stins. If you see them from the bad angle, you will just assume that oh, that's a rufous neck stin, but uh, in India, it, think, it, it gets a bit more complicated because in India, there are lots of little stin. And little stin from the bad angle also can look like a, a spoonbill sandpiper. So a bird to look out for. We believe that there are more of them lurking out there, you know, between Bangladesh and southern India. Um, but anyway, I have to talk about the spoonbill sandpiper because it's a big part of my work. Um, I work What's a lot the total with... population of, uh, of the spoonbill pop, uh, sandpiper, global population, just for the benefit of all of us over here? Um, it's not looking good. The latest estimate was 480 sp individuals. Yeah. The, the, middle number, the middle number was 480 individuals. The highest number possible using those mathematical uh, models is about 650. So it's somewhere between 650 and 300. So it's definitely not doing so well. Less than 500 individuals remain. So for everyone over here, I think this is one of the critically endangered species, you know, and we have uh, amongst the one which is found in the Indian subcontinent as well. Of course, there are many others as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So keep an eye on this species. Uh, the other shopper I want to mention that, again, is a big part of my work is the is the Notman's green shank. And again, it's a species for, uh, for people to look out for when you are in the eastern parts of the country, especially when you're close to West Bengal, I think, in the Sundarbans, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not as charismatic, but actually it's a very unique uh, shorebird. I had a debate once with a uh, with, uh, Notman Greenshank expert. I wouldn't say it was a debate. It was actually an agreement with my colleague uh, who works in Russia. We agree that by, by calling a Greenshank, we put it, we make it become a shadow of the common Greenshank. Everybody mm. say, oh, Notman Greenshank, yeah, it looks a bit like the Greenshank. But actually, if you look at it on its own, very unique sand, uh, very unique sandpiper. Uh, structurally, it's not so much like a Notman green shank. And I did comment about how the shape of the bill makes the bird look like it's smiling. It's it's smiling all the time uh, uh, as it runs around the mud flats, poking at those crabs. Yeah. So um, um, I'm just going to go through a couple of. Uh, uh, I think uh, Raman slides. says okay. Raman just adds that uh, Notman's green shank was has been reported from. Uh, from Bangladesh as well. Bangladesh, yeah. Uh, right, but right. Again, this is a bird that doesn't really stretch into the mainland India. Mm -hmm. Though I do recall somebody sharing a picture of the of the of the Nordman's green shank from off Bombay. Of oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. This is a couple of years ago, uh, and I'll try and pull out that picture and share it. Uh, mm. But it seemed uh, a fairly, you know, kind of a confirmed identity of this particular species from right, right. coast of Bombay. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a species that is also do not doing well. <laughs> now the number the, the 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 estimate of the population is not that high. Mm -hmm. The number that experts will say is about about one thousand. So about twice as many of them as as spoon built sandpipers. Yeah. Uh, but most of the Notman Green Shank in the world, they come to Thailand. They come here to Thailand for the winter. So for those of you who want to see it for sure, hundred percent chance. I invite you to come to Thailand and visit one of our wetland sites. And you can see a flock of them. Sometimes it could be 50 of them or 100 of them. Probably the best place to see Notman's Green Shank here in, in, in uh, Asia. So I think on the same, still on the same tangent of uh, spoon built sandpipers and Notman's Green Shank uh, and a whole bunch of other species, what I just wanted to uh, uh, raise here is that our flyway here, the East Asian Australasian flyway, actually I would say your flyway as well because it involves Northeast India, is not uh, doing well in general because many birds are in decline. Um, even if they were not already listed as endangered or vulnerable, or critically endangered like the spoonies, uh, many species, common birds are already in decline. Um, and about about uh, six years ago, I was asked to provide a number. How many species are globally threatened? I went to count 61 species of, of, of birds in this flyway is considered as globally threatened. And this number was a number that, that I compiled in uh, 2018. Going forward, birds have been added to this number but no birds have been taken out of this number. So I'll give you an example. One bird that many of us here are familiar in the, in the subcontinent and other areas. The black cat kingfisher, uh, a species that we did not know uh, is in decline. A species that we picked out to be in decline. 
uh, we uh, looked at the data sets from Korea. We looked from Singapore here. We look at the data sets from Hong Kong, and I think state of India's birds also uh, demonstrated that all across the distribution, the black cap kingfisher is in decline. So um, I can only say that uh, uh, many species are in decline, and many more will be added to the list, some of which we are only barely beginning to know that they're in decline. Uh, shorebirds are the most uh, are the worst affected group of birds that are in decline in our fly with shorebirds especially and we are quite sure about shorebirds being in decline because our friends in Australia Australians they like to count shorebirds they have been counting shorebirds for a long time um, and they find that many shorebirds the long term trend is in decline if you look at the 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 set of graphs that I put on my slide here on the right side, these are all shorebird species that we can find in northern Australia, and uh, almost all of them are showing a decline pattern, except for a couple of species that seem stable. All right, everything from great knots to uh, eastern curlews are in decline, and of course there are other birds that we tend to forget. Birds that are not famous but are declining until we go and check them, we realize that they have declined a lot. But if we don't check them, we didn't realize how much they have declined. One of the birds that best exemplify this is uh, besides the black cat kingfisher that I mentioned earlier on, is this bird that, uh, again, many birders here will know. This is the mass fin foot. Uh, it's a species that possibly occurs in northeast, uh, but we know that there are some large populations in Sundarbans, uh, especially in Bangladesh Sundarbans. And we did a recent estimate of his world population uh, using very coarse numbers we get from Bangladesh, the numbers the, from Cambodian colleagues, from Thai colleagues. And we came to the conclusion that mass fin food is not doing very well. We thought there were more of them around, but actually if you look at it very carefully, many countries have not recorded mass fin foods for a long time. Um, I look at the Malaysian uh, data quite a lot. And in Malaysia, we actually have no mass fin foods for at least five good years, which is unusual because the last decade, there were mass fin foods every season. But when you have five years with no mass fin foods, something is a bit strange you know which uh, are the other countries generally where the masked fin foots are seen because even from india i do not recall any recent sightings for the last maybe over 10 years uh, yeah and even the sundarban sightings that you speak about are actually all from bangladesh yeah the indian side of the sundarbans absolutely absolutely yeah not much uh from the indian side as far as i know in southeast asia okay i hate to say i can't go to burma now to check whether if there are mass fin foods or not because of the civil unrest in burma uh and they are known to breed in the past in the far north of the country in a, a region called kachin so this is right across the border from arunachal but uh, in Thailand, there has been no mass fin food for about one decade. Uh, and in Malaysia, no mass fin food for about five years. For Indonesia, no mass fin food for about uh, seven or eight years. So it's a, definitely a species in decline that we need to watch out for um, before it slips off the radar. Yeah, Hilal Jyoti Singha says that, uh, you know, till about 100 years back, 100 years ago. 100 uh, years ago. It was reported from the Barak Valley in Assam, uh, southern Assam, which is... Southern Assam. Actually, yeah, it's basically uh, quite inland, I would say, I would think. But yeah, very interesting to uh, know that. Is that in the uh, Brahmaputra floodplains? That's right. That's, you know, it's basically part of the Brahmaputra Delta. It's ah, around, around okay. the place where Brahmaputra actually enters the enters Bangladesh, so mm. uh, possibly a few hundred kilometers upstream uh, of mm. the Sundarbans. Right. So uh, definitely a species in a very bad situation. Um, many species like the mass fin who are in decline. Uh, the next question that many of you will be wondering would be why? You know, why, why, why are these birds in decline? We know the pattern is there. We, we look at the data, it goes down, down, down. Uh, what is causing so many of our migratory birds to be in decline? There, there are a few reasons. Some are very clear reasons. Other are not so clear reasons, partly because we don't have enough data. Um, for Asia, I think there are a few things that I must mention. Um, and again, these are things that are familiar to friends from uh, the subcontinent. One of the gravest threats to migratory water birds in our region that um, I myself am not aware of until I'm now working on this issue for more than three years, is that migratory birds are in trouble from hunting everywhere in the region. And the, all these photographs I'm showing you here, these are taken during the course of my projects. There's a lot of hunting pressure on migratory birds. A lot of this hunting pressure we don't know so well until we went to do surveys and we realized that hey, a lot of markets in, in Burma, in Vietnam, in China, 
they're selling a lot of migratory waterbirds. Where did they get it from? Are these uh, bred in captivity? Um, we are quite sure that many of these migratory birds were caught from the wetlands in the wild. And I think this is one of, uh, I think, and more and more data will confirm in the coming years that illegal hunting, legal and illegal hunting, legal but unsustainable hunting is one of the main drivers of the decline of many of these migratory birds. And of course, that is compounded by the fact that many wetland habitat are in decline across the world. Um, one of the greatest contributors to migratory bird hunting in recent years in our region here in Asia is uh, uh, the use of nets. And this, again, um, is something that we've been documenting in different parts of Asia. Um, in my survey, some of the surveys that I carry out in Laos, in Cambodia and Vietnam, I find that everywhere I go in the countryside and not necessarily in the national parks, all right? This is in the countryside, in the play, in the, in the in the places that there's there's no rangers, these are in the paddy fields, in the fish ponds. There are so many of these uh, mist nets that are being put up by local people for a variety of reasons. Number one, to protect their crops. Number two, to protect their aquaculture ponds from birds that eat fish and prawns. But number three, there are also a lot of people in Southeast Asia, especially, um, that eat wild meat, uh, meat from wild animals and birds. So these nets are put out there to hunt them and to trap them and also to keep them away. You know, some people consider migratory birds as pests that comes to eat their fish and crops. So mist nets are easily available now more than ever before. Um, and they are obviously a, a huge part of the problem for migratory bird conservation. But of course, that is not all. There are other greater challenges that we are facing. Um, the coastal areas of all these countries across Asia Coastal areas are areas that are most easy to develop. If I want to reclaim land, build a new port, build industries, build a refinery, most of these things actually happen on the coast. At the same time, the coasts are also where you find all these mud flats where the migratory birds, many kinds of migratory birds use. Meaning that uh, if you look at it in the long term, the loss of coastal habitats through uh, land reclamation and in recent years, the expansion of all these wind farms is going to be a, a, a serious threat for migratory species all around uh, around the world. But of course, threats are not the only problems. Threats are not the only problems that we have for conserving migratory birds. There are other problems. Some of these problems are created by ourselves and our own bureaucracies. Um, in many parts of the world, migratory birds are not well known to the local authorities. They don't think about migratory birds. They focus on the big animals. They think about the elephants in Malaysia here. They focus a lot on the big animals like the orang utan, the elephants and the tigers. Migratory birds don't get a lot of attention. Um, migratory birds, because they don't get a lot of attention, uh, that also means that the, the habitat that they need to use are not often uh, converted to become protected areas. So a study that we did recently, looking at gaps for protected areas in coastal wetlands, we find that in many countries in Southeast Asia, there are not that many protected areas uh, for these coastal wetlands like mangrove swamps and mud flats, which make things really difficult for us, which also means that we need to think of ways to create more protected areas so that these mud flats that your great knots, your uh, stins, your spoon boots and my are protected well. Another challenge for us is also the science. I think I mentioned science earlier on. Why science is so important for us. Important for us. Science helps us to figure out where are these sites that we must protect. A lot of birds in Asia, we are we are learning a lot about them even now. You know, um, and one of the studies that was done by a, a colleague of mine in Hong Kong, they studied great knots and they tracked great knot migration across Asia. They found that many of these places that the great knots they use that they use on migration are unknown to the ornithologists. Uh, the great knots went to a wetland that is not even documented in your IBAs or protected areas. So that message that is very clear to us from this study is that. We don't know all the key areas that migratory birds are using on their migrations. And to protect them, we have to protect these areas as much as we must protect their wintering areas and their breeding areas. So uh, we have a lot of challenges, all right? We have challenges, we have threats that uh, migratory birds are faced with um, and challenges, some of which are created by ourselves, the, uh, our own bureaucracies, the lack of science on so many of these species. What must we do next to protect migratory species? Quite a few things, and again, these are things that I think of on a daily basis. What are the, the next steps? What must I do next to protect spoonbill sandpipers? What must I do next to protect mass fin foods and other migratory species? I think in general, there are five things that I, I want to mention. 
the first step is the science to know where these priorities are. The next step is to sort out the legislation. Legislation is actually a very important tool for us to make sure that we have all these laws to protect wetlands, to protect forests, and also to protect uh, migratory birds amongst other kinds of animals, all right? We also need to make sure and show it clearly to local people that conservation can help them, can help them through their livelihoods. And one way of helping local people with livelihoods is through ecotourism. You know, if you can bring uh, people from other countries to come to this area, pay money to see migratory birds, you can show local people that, hey, my wetland is worth protecting. My forest is worth protecting. And if I keep these wetland here, over time, there will be bird watchers coming from England, from Japan, who will spend a lot of money to come here and to pay for entrance fee that could come into your livelihoods to help these species. So showing local people that migratory birds can help their livelihoods is actually a very important thing that actually very few people think about. Um, but those of us working in ecotourism, we know this very well. We need to make them more aware. That's why we need to have public and local engagement. But most of all, we also need to work across the region. Because of the fact that migratory birds, they travel across many countries. One country doing things on its own is not good enough. You need these different countries to harmonize how they protect migratory birds with each other. So in the Central Asian flyway, India must find ways to work with Central Asian countries, with Sri Lanka, with Russia. In Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Thailand, we must find ways to work with each other, with China, uh, with Japan and Korea, so that we have uh, a similar set of actions that are harmonized to protect these migratory species that we all share at the continental level. Um, what have people done in our flyway? What are kinds of actions and initiatives? There's a lot. And again, building on what I've covered here, many of these exciting projects and initiatives by people I know, or some of these which are projects that I directly work in, hopefully can offer you all a little bit of uh, inspiration on what else can be done you know, to help our migratory birds. I think the easiest way is to monitor them, and monitoring can come from professionals, professional ornithologists going to a wetland to count these birds, uh, over months, over years, for example, through the Asian water bird census that many of us participate in. Um, citizen science also contributes a huge deal to uh, monitoring birds. And um, I share with you some of the efforts that we are doing in, in Vietnam to monitor migratory water birds at some of these really important wetland sites. Knowing where they go, again, I, this is probably the third time I'm talking about the importance of signs and tracking migratory birds. Knowing where they go is very important. And so uh, we need to continue to invest in science. Uh, some of my colleagues in Singapore and in Hong Kong, they have worked closely with uh, other researchers, everything from turns to, um, to shorebirds. And now we know a little bit more. One of the most Im Im amazing things I've learned in one of these studies by a colleague of mine was that they track wimbrels, uh, wimbrels that we have he here in Singapore. And these wimbrels, we always assume that the wimbrels came to Singapore from China and Russia, but it turns out that we were wrong. A lot of these wimbrels that we come to see in wetlands in Singapore, they actually come through India. If you look at the migratory path here, uh, shown on the map, these wimbrels, they came through the east coast of India, through uh, Orissa, Many of them fly across the Himalaya and then across the Tibetan Plateau. So through these tracking studies, we are learning totally new things. We actually also learned that the East Asian and Australasian Flyway and the Central Asian Flyway, which India is typically considered a part of, the, the separation is a bit fuzzy. They actually overlap quite a bit with each other. Overlap quite a bit with each other. Um, so science is very important. Um, but of course, with science, we should also use the science to protect um, areas that we are not protecting. And that is where we must continue to designate new national parks, new nature reserves, new Ramsar sites. I think one of the big achievements that we have here in Southeast Asia uh, is this uh, important wetland in the Eastern Bay of Bengal. This is in Burma. Um, and many years ago, through the efforts of many conservationists working together with the Burma, Burma government, they were able to secure Ramsar site recognition for the coast of Motama. Motama is a big mudflat. It is more than five times the size of uh, of Singapore, uh, and I think about two times the size of Greater Delhi. So it's a very large area of wetland, and uh, we were all very happy that the Myanmar government was going to 
take a step forward to protect these wetlands. So we must continue to protect uh, sites through establishing new nature reserve and PAs. And coming back to my earlier point, we need to, we can never forget livelihoods because we need local people to work with us. They must cooperate with us. And for them to cooperate with us, we need to show them that they can benefit from migratory birds through different means, perhaps through ecotourism. In the case of where I work in Thailand, we show that the migratory birds can coexist with the salt farmer. These landscapes that we have here in Thailand, they are salt farming landscapes. Um, and by managing the landscapes, the way they are right now, migratory birds can continue to use these salt pans to forage, to roost. Um, many farmers in these areas of Thailand, they are very proud of these migratory birds. Some of these farmers also become bird guides. And so they benefit directly from the birding tourists who come here to look at these uh, shorebirds. So showing to local people that migratory birds are important to you, but it can also help your livelihoods. It's a, a very important part of the conservation game. Um, and of course, um, as you have heard from me earlier on about hunting, uh, we need to act on hunting. Uh, it's uh, such a rampant problem in Asia, everywhere from uh, from Bangladesh to China. We have a problem with business, we have a problem with illegal hunting. I think even recently I heard from colleagues that uh, more and more cases of illegal hunting have been found from different parts of northern India. Um, I think the Amra Falcon story is well known, but in Bihar, for example, there are quite a few cases there. So we need to work more strongly on uh, addressing illegal hunting, working with the authorities to crack down and to enforce laws uh, to prevent birds from being illegally hunted. Uh, of course, beyond all these projects I've met, mentioned about, there are also other more creative and innovative pro projects that benefit certain groups of species. Uh, one project that my colleague worked on was the creation of what you call a an artificial high tide roost. So in South Korea, we created this high tide roost for migratory birds to use, partly because the coastal areas are so developed nowadays that migratory birds are struggling to find places to rest. So this project has proven to be quite promising. And I think they're trying to expand it into other areas of Korea in the future. Uh, for the Spoonville Sandpiper, we've invested a lot of money and time and energy to protecting it. One of the most important part of protecting this species is a process called hit starting. Hit starting whereby we basically give the birds a hit start in their lives. We take the birds out from their nest, put it in the facility where they get to live for 20 days without predators. <coughs> when they grow old enough, we then release them back in the wild. So the chances of them being killed by, you know, all these predators in the Arctic is way reduced. So we increase survival and we reduce mortality and hopefully in the long term, it can help increase their population. Um, and of course, uh, last but not least, uh, I wanted to emphasize that we also need to continue working with governments. Sometimes governments don't co cooperate with us, but we need to make sure that we constantly engage them to be getting them involved in the process of conserving migratory birds uh, because they have the power to enact laws and other regulations. And for the public, we try to think of creative ways to you know, engage them. And one of the projects that I felt really proud to be part of is the creation of a, of a board game on migratory birds of Asia. Uh, this is a game that I developed uh, with my friends in a design firm. Uh, we spent two years on this during the pandemic when we were locked down in, in our houses, looking at our laptops uh, all day and night. We decided to come out with this board game on migratory birds in Asia. So we are quite happy about this game because it's the first time back in 2021 that was the first ever board game to feature uh, migratory birds that you and I know. Everything from oriental dwarf kingfishers to black bazaar. Are these familiar Asian species? I think I'm going to conclude soon. Um, I just give uh, everybody a little bit of a wrap up. Uh, also, a bit of the work that I do in bird life. Uh, in bird life, I work. I think again, Mohit has introduced this uh, as our regional coordinator for migratory species. Um, I work with many, many many organizations across the Asia Pacific region uh, to develop projects. Some of the projects you have seen them in my presentation in the last few slides. Uh, we work on a variety of things, but all of us, we work towards a common goal, which is to secure habitats of migratory birds and also to secure the long-term future of some of these species like the spoonbill sandpiper that I've talked about many times. And of course, you as bird watchers, you can do a lot. Um, don't underestimate the power of um, citizen science. Uh, bird watchers can contribute a lot 
the state of India's bird is a, a, a very powerful demonstration of how bird watches across the country through eBird has allowed us to get so much data together that we can actually see for ourselves which birds are doing well, which birds are in decline, which birds are in decline steeply and we need to pay more attention to. So uh, on this note, I would like to conclude my presentation uh, with a little bit of a, a call to action to people in, in the floor. We are bird watching, keep birding, keep submitting your data because you never know how important you, the, the data of some of these common birds that you are seeing in your backyard can contribute to the conservation of this species as shown in the state of India's birds. So I think that's all I have. So I think that's all I have, right? They're very, very happy to pass. They're very, back. very happy to pass the call back to maybe to maybe to call the before we call in. Before we call in, yeah. Gaurav, can you please switch off your mic? Gaurav, can you please switch off your? Yeah, thank you. Is it off now? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry, Dingli. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Dingli. I think I have one question, and of course, uh, I'm sure the audience would also have. We have all <coughs> 50 people, you know, listening to this very interesting uh, discussion and the work that uh, you are supporting as part of the East Asian Central Asia. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, so uh, you know, and of course, uh, you know, uh, you made a very valid point that India is mostly part of the Central Asian Flyway, while yours is the Eastern Fly East Asian Flyway. Uh, and of course, there are some parts of India that are part of your, you know, this thing as well. Uh, but uh, you would realize that, you know, when compared to the Central Asian Flyway, compared to the Central Asian Flyway, you know, yeah, uh, compared to the Central Asian Flyway, which actually involves countries which are politically very volatile, uh, the Central, uh, the East Asian Flyway, uh, definitely have countries which are which cooperate, you know, uh, better with each other. Uh, and of course, they have fairly well developed economies as well. Mm. Uh, so, can you just share a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's the kind of cooperation that happens uh, between, you know, these countries along the East Asian Flyway, starting from, say, Russia, Korea, China, Hong Kong? Kong, Vietnam, all the way down to Australia. So hmm. I guess uh, there are institutional mechanisms over there which are yeah. able to support this particular uh, flyway. I think um, uh, I wanted to mention three things, uh, three so-called cooperation mechanisms that we have in the flyway. But I also want to give the, the wider backdrop of his historical baggage historical baggage actually is one of our biggest challenges to get the government to work together. So um, for those of you who follow the international news, we know that um, so the, the countries in Central Asia, it's uh, a bit volatile because of uh, conflicts here and there and a few other things. But in East Asia, uh, we've got very rich countries like Korea. We've got very rich countries like Japan. We've got rich countries like uh, 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 China as well. Uh, but Japan, China, and Korea has a really complicated historical relationship. And sometimes it's really hard to get our Korean friends, Japanese friends, and Chinese friends to sit together. Partly because they, oh yeah, many years ago you invaded our country and you did this and we never forgot this because you did all these bad things to us. So these are amongst the biggest uh, challenges. And I, I guess it could be a legacy of the, you know, the post-war era, you know, uh, the, uh, and the Cold War era. But the good thing is that we have young people coming up. And I think the thinking of the young people, we are more forthcoming. We are more open to collaboration. We are willing to put historical challenges aside and work together for the common good. Um, one of the things that I keep trying to sell, uh, one of the, the ideas that I'm trying to sell is that uh, you cannot afford to let the government think that, oh, uh, this bird comes from the country that we don't like, therefore we cannot protect it. You know, that is a very dangerous thing. So when I work with um, uh, governments, I always tell uh, governments that this bird is a shared heritage of our continent. It's a bird that is shared by Vietnam and China and Korea and Japan, and it helps to create that sense of global ownership. It is not so easy. You got to do it strategically sometimes. Some countries we try not to mention. Some countries we mention more because people can see the connection with that country. So that is what we uh, try to do uh, in all these narratives of promoting cooperation. But in our five way, there are two or three big ways that people work together. And um, you know that about 20 years ago, um, many conservationists, they worked together to set, set up what we call the East Asia-Australasia Flyway Partnership. This is an organization 
that is headquartered in South Korea. And this organization basically helps to coordinate and facilitate all these regional collaborations. It is not easy for them, I'm sure. I work with them. We sit on the same table talking with governments, knowing that there are all these challenges ahead. But it creates a very formal institutional and fair platform for NGOs to talk to other NGOs, for governments to talk to NGOs, and for governments to talk to governments. But in our region, uh, some countries have also set up what you call a bilateral agreement on migratory birds. So they are not that common yet, but uh, I can give you an example that Australia, Australia has uh, inked an agreement with the Korea government. And this is a government-to-government -government arrangement uh, whereby they come together, they agree on a number of deliverables that they must work together on. This is legally binding to the laws of uh, international cooperation and needs to be ratified in Australia and Korea. So there are also such legal mechanisms, these bilateral legal mechanisms to get countries to work together. I think one of the most powerful mechanisms uh, is the China-Russia agreement. It, this is a formal agreement between Russia and China. And, and this is important because, as, as you know, many birds breed in Russia. Uh, many birds migrate through China. If we can get our and our China friends to work together, we can actually already solve a big part of the so-called international cooperation on migratory birds. And then, of course, more informally, we have all these NGOs working with each other. So BirdLife Partnership, we also have all these international regional cooperation. But more informally, we also have collaborations within France. We work with our friends in India. We work with our friends in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, in Korea, and wherever. So many ways of collaborating the formal ways as you can see how these governments having agreements and partnerships and then as researchers we work with our friends in different parts of the region informally we write papers together on species that we care about so um i think that is what we can definitely push forward going forward yeah yeah, that's wonderful, Dengli. I think you know that is something that uh, you know possibly the 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 governments or the countries in the Central Asian Flyway needs to learn. That mm. means you know keep your differences aside, uh, but yeah. you know let's work together for the cause of the birds. Because I can't imagine, uh, say, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India kind of yeah. working together for something <laughs> similar. And I think that's one of the reasons why we seem to have lost at least the eastern race of the black, uh, sorry, the Siberian crane, for that matter. You know? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a it's a tough one. Uh, the Western race, sorry. Uh, yeah. It only really yeah. has a few numbers now wintering in Iran and it has it stopped coming to India completely for the last exactly. Four, yeah. I, exactly. Yeah, actually, for the Central Asian flyway, I think the biggest player in the Central Asian flyway is India and Kazakhstan. If India and Kazakhstan has a can agree on, uh, you know, a set of common principles, other countries will start to follow and come into the picture. So I think that we need uh, leadership from uh, Indian conservationists India's government, Kazakh conservationists and Kazakh government. And I think with that, it can encourage all the other smaller countries to... But the birds to... have to fly over Afghanistan and Pakistan as well. So I'm just wondering, and we don't even have, you know, solid diplomatic relations with <laughs> these countries. I know, right? <laughs> tough is tough, but we have to start somewhere. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite encouraged by the Kazakh-Indian col collaborations. Go yeah. yeah. And of course, I think Hilal Jyoti mentions about Hubara Bustard. Okay, that's, I think, a success story uh, mm. about the McQueen's Bustard, you know, breeding programs happening in the UAE and the Middle East, uh, yeah. along the Arabian Peninsula. Absolutely. And of course, uh, you know, a, a successful breeding program. And, you know, yeah. much of the birds that we actually see in winters in Rajasthan and Gujarat, uh, you will see that those birds are carrying a tag, which means that those are the mm. birds which have been artificially reared or bred. And yeah. of course, released into the wild. We are actually having a similar program now for the Indian Bustard as well, or the Great Indian Bustard, and even the mm -hmm. Lesser Florican. And over the last Lesser one year, Florida. I've had the opportunity to actually visit the conservation breeding centers of both these species in Rajasthan. You know, so uh, mm -hmm. so I guess small steps, but uh, you know, yeah. Uh, but these are the two birds which are actually fairly limited to India. Lesser Florican is mostly an endemic within India, Absolutely. and Great yeah. Indian uh, Great Indian Bustard just seems to hop across the border between India and Pakistan, you know, that's about it. Yeah. Uh, that's one, I think another question before uh, I think I read anybody else's questions uh, is uh, about the uh, Spoonbill Sandpiper. Mm. Uh, uh, I just, uh, a little more curious, I think this is one bird which is on the top tick list 
of all the bird watchers in india <laughs> of course uh, you know what is counted is seeing the birds within the indian subcontinent you know yeah. going to thailand and seeing the bird is not counted right right <laughs> okay and most of the birders that i know the serious twitchers that i know you know have mm. seen this bird uh, in bangladesh in bangladesh uh, so what's uh, so what's the kind of numbers that come to bangladesh i think you mentioned some time back about a dozen or so or is it more I think my friend Sayam Chowdhury is the best man to give you the answer, yeah. but I have a rough idea. Um, I think one of the key sites for the species is in uh, Chattogram, Chittagong Division. Yeah, Chittagong, yeah. Um, so Nadia Island is the probably the best place to see the Spoonbill Sandpiper. I remember the numbers used to be higher in the past. It was about uh, 30 to 40 birds. I spoke to Sayam recently, 30 to 40 birds, but this number seems to have gone down. I'm not sure why, actually. The count from last year was not that high from Sonadia Island. Um, we are hypothesizing, hypothesizing that either they decline, either the whole population declined some more, or that the birds have shifted somewhere, maybe to Burma, because Chittagong is very near to Myanmar. And uh, in it's Myanmar, we have, yeah. Yeah, we, have a, we have another site that my colleagues monitor in uh, a, a, a Burmese province called uh, Rakhine, Rakhine on the Bangladeshi border. Okay. Um, so that site, uh, I, I think we have not checked it because there's uh, some instability in that region. Yes. I'll be interested to see what's the situation in Rakhine right now. But the funny thing is that, uh, KB, is that the, the population in wintering in China has increased. It has increased. I don't know why. So we see a pattern that is increased in China, is increased in Vietnam, but it's decreased in Burma and Bangladesh. Is it a general, genuine decrease or is it that the bird populations are slowly changing over to the east? I, I don't have an answer. Yeah. Or not moving so much southern, you know, uh, compared yeah. to what it was because, you know, yeah. the earth is growing warmer and everything, all those things. Absolutely. One yeah. more question I have is on the Yellow Sea. I think you mentioned about the mm. critical role that it plays along the East Asian flyway. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, I've also read about uh, reports about the threats uh, that particular area faces. So just can you talk a little more about it? I mean, what is China doing to protect that Yellow Sea area? Because it seems to be, you know, the, all the birds seem to be converging there, you know, like mm. a small <laughs> and then, of course, you know, going up and down. Yeah. So um, one, of the, one of the things that um, I, I, I'm very impressed with is the, uh, the, the number of act initiatives that is happening in China. Uh, recently, I was in China to attend an international conference on Yellow Sea conservation. And I learned from the Chinese that uh, there are huge plans to conserve huge areas. Many of the big areas are already protected areas. Um, and the Chinese is pumping money to get rid of invasive species, to have long-term monitoring, to improve the management of sites. Um, we we worked with the Chinese a few years ago to push for their sites to be recognized as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And I think they were very proud of it in the end because the sites became recognized. One of the most important sites for the spoon sandpiper was recognized as a UNESCO site. So um, I think there are many good initiatives happening in China. The Koreans don't want to be outdone by the Chinese, right? And so they put in a good fight. The Koreans also are doing sim similar things. They are pushing for more wetland initiatives. They say, hey, we got, we got to do as well as China, all right? So let's, let's protect more areas. Let's propose UNESCO sites as well. Maybe we can beat the Chinese at the UNESCO sites. Okay. So the, the Koreans put in a bid for four UNESCO sites a uh, couple, couple of years ago, and all four now became UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So, so there's a bit of a, I would say this is a constructive competition okay. between China and Korea to protect more wetlands. And I would that's like to the kind of, That's the kind of fight that countries need to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... yeah. And, and so now uh, as, the, as the outsiders, uh, we are watching carefully is North Korea going to follow them? Because you see your neighbors are doing these things, right? So, so they are encouraging signs from North Korea. Actually, North Korea joined the Ramsar Convention only in the last five, six years. Okay. And they have declared a Ramsar site. Before that, no Ramsar site from North Korea. So it's a positive sign. I hope that uh, their country will do more, but at least they start somewhere small, yeah. But are you able to cooperate with the, the North Korea as well? Uh, because I that's, think it's a challenge. But with we the have, uh, over there, or with the, I'm sure that's a country which has a lot of lack of data. Yeah, absolute lack of data. Yeah, but actually, um, I recently learned from one of my colleagues who are who are based in South Korea. They have dealings in North Korea, uh, promoting environmental cooperation. So trying to promote uh, Korea to Korea. Um, 
um, goodwill through environmental things. So they're trying to get South Koreans and North Koreans to count birds together. So I think there are some promising signs. I'm an optimist. I think we have to be optimistic in conservation, right? So I see some uh, a good cooperation. I think it's kind of shuttered by the COVID uh, era, but hopefully this can blossom again when things become better. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. I'm trying to read through some messages. Uh, Gitanjali says, wonderful session. Thanks for organizing this, especially to know the importance of the flyways. I think that's obviously... Uh, and Saru... Pava says, uh, yes, all the global, we face global warming and this directly or indirectly connect with those mm. issues like the migration. So why we all raise our voice together for all these? Of course, I think, uh, you know, people like Deng Li are, and his colleagues and of course in other parts of the world as well are doing wonderful work. <laughs> work. <laughs> of course, uh, Hilal, we've uh, uh, heard about your uh, Hubara buster migrating through Pakistan. Of course, mm. you know, again, I think there is... Uh, what I understood now is that the hunting that used to happen about the McQueens or the Hubara busted in Pakistan is uh, fairly controlled now. I mean, they're mm. not really issuing permits to, you know, the sheikhs from the UAE or Arab uh, yeah. to come and uh, hunt over there uh, free of this thing. Yeah. Uh, Arul, uh, Bird Conservation World Cup, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is a season a, of uh, the I have TV. a question. <laughs> yeah, please. I have a question for you, actually. What is what is the size of uh, the the uh, Indian bird watching community right now? How many birders would you what you estimate uh, a rough estimate for the country? Okay. I would uh, okay. So I'll just give you an answer. I uh, try and give an answer. You know, uh, mm. uh, so in a in a slightly broader way, uh, the Facebook platform that I have, uh, mm. which I built up, you know, uh, uh, you know, has about half a million members. <laughs> but it doesn't <laughs> mean that half a million people are contributing. Uh, but uh, just from an engagement perspective, you know, I'll just mm. give some statistics. Uh, there are about uh, 300 posts a day. That okay. are 300 people putting pictures from. If, so you can do virtual bird watching for almost the whole of India. And mm. there are about 50 to 60,000 people who are actually seeing those posts every day, right. maybe 70,000. Right. So it's a huge number. But, uh, but then there are other platforms as well. And of course, uh, looking at the kind of... Uh, 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 you know the 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 ecotourism or the bird travel tourism bird travel related infrastructure that has come up in uh, remote part of the country remote parts of the country yeah. which i'm sure you also had the opportunity of visiting including in the northeast and i was recently in Britain. yeah so there seems to be a growing interest uh, in bird watching in bird photography perhaps uh, more mm. so and what is happening is more and more of them are also contributing data towards ebird and that's i think mm. uh, you know coming out uh, uh, through uh, the initiatives like State of India's Birds uh, that got published recently. So to put an exact number to, <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, in spite of that, what I can say is that uh, most of the bird watchers and the bird photographers or the bird enthusiasts in India uh, mm. seem, seem to be concentrated in the larger cities, which is ah, Calcutta, okay. Delhi, Delhi Belt, then of course, Bangalore, Madras, Bombay, Pune, mm. and some spill over into the uh, the not so big towns and then of course uh, very mm. few in uh, in the smaller towns and even within india i think there are some pockets like say bihar uh, chhattisgarh or possibly mm. jharkhand orissa uh, where the number of bird watchers are or even up the eastern mm. eastern parts of up the uh, the number of bird watchers are low i think it's also reflected in the socio economic conditions of those areas you know yeah. so, yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's a very long answer to your small question. Uh, yeah. But, but I, I, I'm quite, I'm quite convinced that there are more in uh, bird watchers in India than any country in Southeast Asia because I can randomly, I just share with you an experience. Last year I was in Chennai and I went to a wetland in Chennai on my own. I just took a taxi there. I didn't expect to see anybody, but true enough, I bumped into a bird watcher walking in the wetland. So if I can go to a random wetland and meet a birder. In Chennai, there must be a lot of birders. Yeah, yeah there are. Yeah. So there are, as I said, you know, they're concentrated around the yeah. big cities. You know, right. And mostly, most of them are young, mm. in the age group of about thirty to fifty. You know, 30 that to 50, age. Yeah. Mm. I would say around forty plus or minus ten years. Mm. I think that's the age which is uh, mm. most represented by the bird enthusiasts. Right. And I'm actually glad about the fact that this ecotourism around birding and bird photography has come up in a very nice way. Uh, in many parts of the country and uh, people are able, the local people are able to earn livelihoods. And of course, mm. 
you know, once they earn livelihoods, you know, they are obviously able to support the cause or champion the cause of conservation Absolutely. of those particular species. I mean, you can take an example of Arunachal, mm. Nagaland, many mm. areas in Assam, North Bengal, Ladakh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Andaman, South India and Kerala. So there are these pockets that have now come up in a very nice, Goa, for example, hmm. uh, which are, you know, very popular with bird watchers and supporting, you know, hmm. local population and local economies uh, through the hmm. bird uh, tourism that is coming up. Yeah. Uh, any other question, gentlemen and uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in case you have, please feel free to ch- you know, type in. Uh, this particular platform doesn't seem to permit, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. open Maybe conversation, but uh, we will read it out for you. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So, Bird Conservation World Cup, you know, there's a <coughs> uh, uh, you know uh, uh, World Cup happening right now. I'm not yeah. a cricket enthusiast, but uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's really good. Thank you, Parul, for comparing this to the World Cup, Bird Conservation World Cup. Maybe I'll take one more question because I might need to jump off for another meeting. Today is a, it's a bit of a crazy day for me. Yeah, but there's I see there's a question from uh, Hello Jyoti Singha um, on uh, North Northeast India for market sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think Hello, that's Jyoti. a yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting question. Um, actually, um, Northeast India, it's... Uh, okay, I, I talk about e- East Asian Australasian Flyway but, and also Central Asian Flyway, but there's another flyway that is not famous to people. And this is the... Uh, what we call the Eurasia African Flyway. Eurasia African Flyway. So a lot of birds on this flyway, they move in... Uh, well, you could say in a diagonal fashion across Asia, cut through India. And then they go to Africa. I think quite a few species of bird does this flyway. The best known is the armor falcon. Uh, but if you look at it more carefully, and this is something I'm hearing from my friends in Beijing. I have a friend who is a UK expat living in Beijing. He's a very keen birder, uh, also a keen conservationist. And he has got a project to track cuckoos, uh, the migration of common cuckoos and the migration of common swifts. So these common cuckoos and common swifts, besides armor falcons, they are flying across China going through India. Uh, some of them go a bit south to Bangladesh and back to India again. They do this diagonal across uh, East Asia, Northeast Indian states, and then into Africa. So very unusual. Uh, I don't exactly know all the stopover sites uh, because it could be anywhere. Of course, um, the Amur Falcon illustrates some of the key uh, uh, stopover sites. I think was a, there's a lake up in uh, Nagaland where a lot of these uh, falcons are congregating. Uh, but we just don't know that well enough for cuckoos and common swifts and other small bodied birds. So um, uh, I wish I could answer your question better, but uh, I don't know the full answer until we do more science and research. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dingley. I think very, very informative talk. And I think talking about an area which obviously impacts us, but you know, but, we are, uh, you know, we are really far. Uh, 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 can you please? Uh, can you please uh, and it isn't really part of our consciousness in terms of how deeply the Indian bird life is also impacted uh, by the East Asian flyway. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dingli. Mohit, over to you, please. Mohit, uh, you need to switch on your mic. I think you're on the mute. <laughs> Mohit? Okay, I want to... I want to thank you, KB, first for starting this Let's Go Birding series. And this gives us an opportunity to call people like Dingley, you know, who deliver these jaw-dropping webinars, uh, talks, which are so informative. And, you know, uh, so last time Dingley did this webinar, which was fantastic. And this time, you know, he's he's made it even better with all the information he's given to the people here. So thank you uh, for, for making this happen. This is how we need to do things, you know, if I'm in the tourism business and this is what businesses are supposed to do to bring more opportunities to the fraternity. So thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you, my team. Thank you, Dingdi. And thank you, KB, for uh, and, for being here. And uh, Dingdi, we look forward so to meeting success. you in Delhi whenever you're here. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I have set my eyes on the Mishmi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please come. I was yes. there in December. Yes, and, uh, yes, know, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Wonderful. Have a thank you so, so much. Do everyone. that. Yeah. Thanks for thank thanks you. for having uh, me here. Friends. Look forward to the next session. Uh, I have already sounded off Aparajita Datta, uh, who's done a PhD. In, okay. Uh, wonderful. So, uh, we will try and get her That's on the on the next uh, uh, one that we have in the month of November. 
So this is just the information yeah. of everybody. Yeah. Uh, she's done a PhD on hornbills in Arunachal. So I think it would be wonderful to hear as well, her as well. Oh, that will be fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, KB. Thank, Thank you, Hamley. Have a great everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Have a great, have a great night. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.